So good afternoon, everyone. We're so excited to have our panelists today on prison policies in the time of COVID-19. A public defender's office here in Cook County since 1984, and he's held many positions. And now he's she's a chief of staff to Amy Campanelli. He's also been an adjunct uh, professor at John Marshall since 1997, teaching Herzog. And fun fact, he was actually my Herzog teacher when I was a student here at John Marshall. Uh, we also have with us associate professor Hugh Mundy, who's been a federal defender for the. Uh, Federal defender for 10 years prior to coming to John Marshall, and he's currently teaching evidence, criminal law, and crim pro at John Marshall. So um, I, I wanted to give both of our panelists time to kind of set the stage of this discussion. Lester Finkel will be talking about uh, COVID-19 and the prison policies here um, in Cook County, and uh, Professor Mundy will be talking about the prison policies uh, and at the federal level with the Bureau of Prisons. So uh, Lester, if you wouldn't mind beginning us off today. Oh, sure, no problem. Uh, as Tanya said, I'm a uh, assistant Cook County Public Defender. I'm the chief of staff uh, for our office. And uh, definitely the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 has been causing uh, issues with the criminal court system and specifically with the jail. And just to give you a snapshot, uh, on March 1st, before there was a single uh, COVID case at Cook County Jail, we had 5,604 people at the jail. And keep in mind that the jail complex, if you've ever been to 26th in California, you know it stretches from 26th Street down to 31st Street in California to Sacramento. So it, it takes up a sizable amount of real estate. Uh, that jail complex has approximately 3,600 cells. So with 5,600 people in the jail and 3,600 cells, you're going to have people doubling up, tripling up. They have certain areas where there are wards where 10, 15, or 20 people would be living. We saw a problem that was developing. We saw basically the train wreck ahead of us on the tracks and we knew that we had to act. So on March 20th of this year, the Public Defender's Office filed a motion asking for an emergency release of individuals from the jail based on different categories, whether they were medically vulnerable, whether they were older, whether or not they had a low level charge. You have some people locked up in jail on misdemeanors. Some people are locked up for low level uh, felony offenses. And we had a hearing in front of the presiding judge of the criminal court system, which is at 26th in California, on March 23rd. And he ordered emergency hearings case by case in front of the individual judges that those cases were assigned to, to take place over the following week, approximate week or two weeks. The jail population started to go down and the low point was right around May 1st, where we had approximately 4,055 uh, people at the county jail uh, again. So we had reduced the jail population by around 15 or 1600. And this is taken into consideration that people were coming in at the same time that we were trying to get people out because you still have the daily arrests that were being made. But now the jail population has gone up. So from the low of about 4055, I checked the uh, records this morning. And according to the sheriff's office, as of this morning, there are 4,597 people in the county jail. Uh, over the course of that time, uh, over 550, uh, 550 detainees tested positive for the uh, COVID-19 virus. Over 200 correctional officers tested positive for the COVID-19 virus. Seven detainees died. I believe three correctional officers died. So, you know, it, I believe it could have been much much worse had the jail population remained at 5,600, but it still, in my opinion, should have been lower and more lives perhaps could have been saved and more health risks could have been prevented. So I'll stop there and turn it over to you. Thanks, it's great to be here, everyone. Um, I'm seeing a few names of uh, graduates who have just been hired by the Public Defender's Office, so especially glad to see you all here, and thanks, Dean Luma and, and, and Lester. So uh, this is an overwhelming issue, and uh, I'm a little daunted by the magnitude, and uh, when that happens, I usually resort, as many of my students know, to checklists and uh, and stories that kind of uh, highlight the, uh, the, the issue on a local level. So I guess I'll start with 
uh, a story uh, that comes to us by way of Arkansas. This is a state and not federal prison uh, where um, prison labor, a largely farm work, uh, is both unpaid and considered essential uh, by the governor uh, in terms of the work that remains during the pandemic. Um, in uh, one Arkansas prison, 46 uh, inmates uh, who were required to continue working, again, in a, in a, in a farming capacity, um, 43 tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, six were critically ill. All were taken to solitary confinement, um, the whole. Uh, three died. Uh, and um, the prison essentially orchestrated what amounts to a kind of cover up of the, of the issues. Um, largely in part, and this will come as no surprise, prison health care is bad on its best day and usually administered by for-profit companies, in this case, a company uh, called WellPath, um, that profits at the expense of uh, minimizing the quality of medical care to its prisoners. And so prisons are uniquely uh, unequipped to handle uh, these sorts of outbreaks. Um, they're basically treating everything with ibuprofen. So they're, they're uniquely incapable of handling virtually any serious uh, illness. But through the, the, Ill, uh, the, the, the Arkansas case and, and comparable cases in, in Illinois and elsewhere, uh, I've kind of called a list of problems at the, at the federal and state level um, that I'll start off as kind of a framework for our uh, discussion. So, on February 25th, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and this is fairly true of state uh, prisons as well, uh, issued uh, a memo uh, that was written by a kind of hastily appointed coronavirus czar in the Bureau of Prisons. Uh, and, and I'll cut to the chase. The, the virus is likely to cause a pandemic. Uh, and it, it did. Uh, and the reasons I think can, oh, again, fall into this list um, that we're seeing both at the federal and state level. One, a concerted effort to minimize symptoms uh, by the um, uh, providers of, of medical care. And that goes back to some of the for-profit groups that are responsible for health care. Uh, two, mixing sick and healthy people. So. Um, and as Lester said, right, like not enough bed space to accommodate people. And so putting sick people with healthy people. Number three, and especially in the, in the federal system, transporting prisoners. The BOP has this kind of labyrinth of prisoner transportation and holding areas until prisoners reach their final destinations uh, at their, at their um, prison, which is generally not a function of geography, it's more a function of bed space and security classifications. Uh, three, pressuring correctional, uh, sorry, four, uh, pressuring uh, correctional officers to work even when correctional officers were exhibiting symptoms. There's a memo that uh, uh, um, in a lawsuit was obtained from WellPath uh, to correctional officers, and I quote, if your test results uh, are positive, you may be required to work even if uh, if you have displayed minor or no symptoms. So, uh, yeah, so that's number four. Number five, underreporting data, right? So mixing in um, statistics to underrepresent the number of people who have actually been, um, been uh, infected. Um, let's see, number six or seven, quarantine and solitary confinement, right? So unable to provide the necessary environment for uh, isolating or quarantining uh, uh, inmates, uh, and then failing to util utilize compassionate release at both the state and federal level. And I will leave you with this number. So under the First Step Act, which might be the only piece of bipartisan legislation that has come out of the Trump administration, uh, there's a provision for compassionate release for prisoners who are high risk uh, and uh, and um, especially so in uh, in this uh, pandemic era. 
So in the last, since, since the pandemic began in say, say March 1, 1,700 petitions for compassionate release filed, 1,501 denied by the Bureau of Prisons. So I don't know quite what that percentage is, but it's high. Um, so from February 25th to this virus is going to be a pandemic to where we sit right now, um, those are some of the reasons why so many prisoners uh, are, are, are ill and so many are dying in Bureau of Prisons and, and state custody. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I want to go back to uh, Lester Frankel briefly. Um, Cook County Jail and Chicago was in the news um, and stated as um, the jail being one of the hottest spots for coronavirus in the nation at one point. And I'm sure that uh, Gavina is you and your office to work with the state's attorney's office, the sheriff's office to respond to this. And I know there's been quite a timeline of of events and actions, um, if you could just kind of talk us through some of the ways that uh, you and your office have tried to work with other Cook County offices for uh, bail reform and, and also um, to advocate on behalf of your clients. Well, the story of bail reform goes back a little farther. If we go back to uh, 2018, we had been asking uh, for bail reform and in fact, we submitted a request to the uh, Illinois Supreme Court Rules Committee for a reformation of the bail structure because the way it generally had been up to that point was there seemed to be a presumption in operation that someone should be held unless there was a reason to let him go, unless there was a reason for him to be released. Uh, and I say him simply because the majority of people at the county jail are, are men. Um, but then, uh, uh, actually I should, go back further, I'm sorry, I said 2018. Actually, it was 2017 that we submitted the request to the Supreme Court Rules Committee. They're still thinking about it, by the way. It's been uh, going on three years now. I'm sure they're gonna be focusing on it uh, very, very soon. But then the chief judge of Cook County, a man named Timothy Evans, he entered an order, which he called General Order 18.8A. That took effect on September 18th of 2017, which applied a risk assessment tool that was developed by a company down in Kentucky called the Arnold Foundation. And that put risk assessment based on risk of flight and risk on threat to public safety. And the presumption was supposed to uh, shifted to a person should normally be released from jail unless there's a reason to hold him or her. So with that in place, we started to work as, as the pandemic became more apparent we started to work with the state's attorney and with the sheriff in February and in early March, trying to get agreed upon releases. Uh, by the time we filed an emergency motion on March 20th, we had arranged for perhaps about 100 or 150 people to get out uh, by agreement, with agreement of the state, agreement with us. And we realized that process was rather slow. The virus was overtaking things far faster then we could go and reach an agreement. I understand the position of the state. They were looking out for you know, certain interests and they were hesitant to uh, you know, agree to certain people to be released. We wanted to put it to the judges. So we filed the motion. There was a hearing on March 23rd. And although technically it was only Judge Martin uh, who ruled on it, it was pretty much embraced by the rest of the judiciary in the suburban districts, as well as uh, the other judges in, in Cook County. And we were able to get people out far faster, far more. Uh, I did an analysis, in fact, of the uh, individuals who were released from the county jail uh, uh, for compassionate reasons and also in light of the pandemic. And about one quarter of the people who were released from the county jail were released uh, with by agreements between the defense and the state's attorney. Three quarters of them were released after contested hearings in which the judge said, no, I believe this person is safe to be released. So we were able to go and have those uh, hearings. Uh, individuals were released. Uh, the sheriff was uh, good. They set up a system where every person before they were released was tested. History was taken, temperature was taken, uh, you know, uh, check once the tests became available. Because if you remember, 
uh, right at the beginning in March, there were the testing testing for COVID were few and far between. So, uh, but once the test became available, they tested people as they got out. They set up an isolation unit. Uh, they set up a quarantine unit. I learned the difference between isolation and quarantine. If uh, if I might be exposed to someone, I'm isolated. If I actually have the virus, then I'm quarantined, and that's the the way they interpreted it over at the jail. And so we work with the state. We have shared information. We have shared information with the uh, sheriff. And then there was the whole question of court system and how we continue with court. And for that, I realized this uh, program here is being broadcast on WebEx, but for for whatever reason, uh, the chief judge's office went with Zoom. Zoom has become a criminal defense attorney's friend these days, uh, you know. And so at first there were only a few licenses, but most recently I heard uh, the chief judge of uh, Cook County is arranging for 400 Zoom licenses, one for every judge in Cook County. And uh, uh, once we reopen, it'll be a soft reopening to the court system because uh, they don't want everybody rushing back and pretty much court will continue for weeks afterwards, as I understand it, through Zoom. I'll cover that. I certainly have a follow-up question. Um, I want to make sure everybody's on mute. I certainly have some follow-up questions, but please put uh, your questions in the chat, and we'll be taking questions for our panelists um, from those that have been able to join us today. Uh, Professor Mundy, I wanted to ask you, um, you listed several reasons for or several several factors that have contributed to the to the poor conditions of federal inmates during the pandemic. I'm wondering how this moment impacts the larger movement against privatization of prisons and how advocacy how how that advocacy is going now. Yeah, so uh as as you and and any of my former students on 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 this call know i'm not actually a public defender anymore i just subject my students to lots of stories about when i was and so i reached out to a number of uh friends and and former colleagues in a somewhat representative area of uh the country so new york california illinois tennessee florida Texas and Washington. And for the most part, uh, they are all um, dealing with privatized companies um, administering health care and, and many of them at the jail level. So when we think about the federal system, normally it's, it's reasonable to think about uh, the Federal Bureau of Prisons, but um, many of uh, their clients are housed in county jails awaiting position and, and as you can imagine, both at the state and federal level, there's a huge backlog. Everything is, is at a standstill at, at this point. Uh, and the U.S. Marshals contract with county jails to hold federal prisoners pretrial in virtually every jurisdiction, save maybe for, uh, for New York. Um, all of those jails, uh, from my from my um, uh, conversations, are used uh, are using privatized healthcare again, and these companies are interested in profit over over care and are ill-equipped to handle even basic health needs long before there was a pandemic. So any kind of mental illness, any kind of uh, chronic condition. Uh, and I don't think that any of these companies have really stepped up. I think that it's been more uh, about um, uh, uh, minimizing uh, the, the, the outbreaks, uh, attempting to kind of game the numbers to demonstrate that fewer than, um, than the actual number of, of inmates are uh, infected. Um, and I mean, this is the, it, both in terms of jails and prisons, this is sort of the, the trajectory of um, the way that we incarcerate uh, individuals. So I, I don't, I think privatized healthcare is happening virtually everywhere. And if, if my calls are representative, then that's true. And it's, it's, it's terrible on its, on its best day. Um, and uh, 
many of the state governors in 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 the the states that uh, that I discussed are um, reassuring the public about growing numbers of um, uh, of of COVID positives by by stating plainly, oh look, this is this is happening in our jails and prisons, so you need not be concerned because these wow. numbers that you're seeing are just prisoners. So there's this kind of uh, you know, the, 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 it's 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 a kind of um, uh, even exaggerated dehumanization um, of of inmates than we would normally see in our everyday uh, yeah. everyday um, work. And yeah. and so uh, yeah, to answer your question, I don't know of any states that are not using privatized healthcare, and I don't think it's working anywhere particularly well. Yeah. And if I could just follow up on uh, what you said, uh, at the county jail, I'm not as familiar with IDOC, but at the county jail, the sheriff uh, of Cook County employs approximately 6,000 individuals, 3,000 of whom are correctional officers. So those 3,000 people who are in the jail every day are coming out of the jail every day. They're going home to their community. They're going to their families. They're going to see their friends. So to say that something is confined to a locked facility is, is ludicrous. Yeah, great point. I think I think what's been interesting in this whole um, moment is how people have used one use certain certain as certain um, groups of the population to say it's okay if if they get sick, whether that be elderly, whether that be the inmate population, and also have how people have prioritized uh, economics. And the economy over people's lives. And I think we see that here too. We have uh, questions in the chat. Um, is there a difference in health and safety outcomes related to COVID 19 between public and private jails and prisons? I think that might be more appropriate for you. Uh, uh, so that's a great, that's a great question. And uh, whoever asked that question, would you? Be my research assistant because <laughs> I was very interested. You know, so uh, I, I think like Darby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know um, the answer, and and part of it, I mean, depends on uh, geography. So in the in the in the South, um, Corrections Corporation of America is um, uh, kind of the the the, the predominant, um, at least in terms of holding facilities and jails private entity. And I would suspect that um, the numbers are comparable because public facilities, e even even public facilities are utilizing private healthcare like Arkansas utilizing uh, a contract with WellPath, um, whereas the private entities uh, are private and also utilizing private. So I, I bet the numbers are comparable, but uh, that would be interesting. Uh, interesting study and you're hired, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, a follow-up question for Lester. Um, one of the things that was very prominent at the beginning of this conversation was the conditions of the jail cells. And I think you alluded to it, but lack of PPE, lack of soap, lack of hand sanitizers. And then again, you also alluded to the fact that, you know, social distancing wouldn't be very possible given the numbers of inmates in the cells. Um, and I understand there's been federal lawsuits um, in in condition or, or related to the conditions of the of the jail. Could you speak a little bit to that? Right. There was a federal lawsuit filed in May in the Northern District of uh, Illinois. Uh, the uh, consortium of attorneys who were working on the case worked with us, but the lawsuit wasn't filed by the public defender. It was filed uh, by a group of lawyers headed by Black Bowman. I don't know if anybody in the audience knows Black Bowman, but he runs something called the MacArthur Justice Center out of Northwestern, uh, what is it, Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law. And uh, so he filed that lawsuit uh, condemning the conditions, had dozens of affidavits from different people who were at the county jail, no soap, no social distancing, living in wards, no masks, um, no sanitizers, nothing. And that wasn't the narrative that was originally being put out by the authorities. 
uh, but uh, he had uh, a lot of information. As I understand it, there were even some individuals who had smuggled in cell phone cameras to take video and live stream video to show the conditions that were going on in the county jail, to show people lying there out in the open, uh, uh, basically sick and possibly dying. So uh, that lawsuit was filed and went in front of a federal judge, Matthew Kennelly. And um, in, in around mid to late May, Judge Kennelly issued his uh, decision. Uh, uh, although the lawsuit asked for release of individuals plus an injunctive order to have better conditions at the jail, Judge Kennelly only ordered injunctive relief. He did not actually order the release of any individuals. He left that to the discretion of the individual criminal court judges at, at the various criminal courthouses to decide whether someone should be released. He, however, ordered uh, more soap, more sanitizers, as well as monitoring of the conditions to make sure that the situation would improve. So uh, how would you describe the current conditions? I still, I am concerned. There are fewer COVID cases. As of this morning, I believe the sheriff indicated there were 26 positive individuals uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the Cook County Jail. And remember, we had a high one point of over 400 people at any given time who were positive at the Cook County Jail. So that has gone down and that has subsided. But at the same time, the number of people in the jail is creeping up and we don't have a vaccine. You know, uh, you know, the curve might be going down, but everybody is saying that it may rebound. So we had a low of 4,000 people at the county jail. Now we're slightly more than 4,500. If it continues to creep up, it's just, you know, it's an impossibility to avoid a resurgence of coronavirus at the jail. And all you need is a few people coming in. Screening is helpful. It's great, but people are asymptomatic. Taking a temperature doesn't always find things. And you still have people who are coming in and out, visitors who come in and out of the jail, uh, correction officers who come in and out, new people who are arrested over a weekend who are coming in and then being released. So um, it's, still, uh, it's still a matter of concern uh, that the population is increasing. In my personal view, I think that the population should be uh, under 4,000, probably close to 34, 3,500, uh, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not a judge. We have another question in the chat. In, the chat. Um, in a recent episode of John Oliver last week, uh, inmates were being charged and upcharged for soap that was being discussed in the episode. Can we speak to the Ill illegality of this practice? Well, I know. I think that it's absolutely atrocious. I saw that last week tonight with John Oliver episode, and uh, he hit it. Uh, he hit it on the head. You say that people are uh, need to have soap. But then you charge individuals who have no money, who don't have enough money for bail, who don't have any money in their commissary account, and you're saying that you can't have it unless you, uh, uh, unless you pay for it. And I think the point that John Oliver made, and I agree with him a thousand percent, is that even if you're in jail for some you know, misconduct or some crime, you're not there to be given a death sentence. And to go and punish someone with the possibility of a death sentence with infection, with illness, is, in my opinion, just, it's inhumane. Absolutely. Um, I, don't, I don't know about the federal prison system, so I defer to you on that. Uh, consistent. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, I I I I, has, I I don't know. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to find some positives from the pandemic right now, just because I I don't want this conversation to be utterly hopeless. Uh, but one of the one of the sort of positives um, is all of these um, uh, problems, which is an understatement, have been going on in jails and prisons. Uh, since the era of mass incarceration and probably before in terms of, I mean, raising soap prices is utterly consistent with all of the other, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say bullshit on a recorded call, but if I were allowed to say that, this is what's been going on um, with commissary, with telephone calls, with visitation, with medical care, 
for decades. And um, we've seen in the context of policing uh, what a powerful tool video can be uh, in bringing to the fore um, issues of grave injustice. And that doesn't really exist in jails or prisons. Um, it's very difficult to document any of this. Uh, and it's been going on uh, for a long, long time. So uh, I'm not surprised. I also saw the John Oliver piece and, 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 and sadly was not surprised uh, at, at all, although I appreciate what John Oliver has done to, to, to sort of um, uh, uh, publicize these, these issues. But to the extent the pandemic um, can mobilize uh, people to really care about meaningful bail reform and meaningful sentencing reform, um, then maybe that is, is one positive. But Jesus, a lot of people are suffering uh, for, for what, what may or may not be a positive. If I could just make, a, I guess, a philosophical point, and by the way, I'm immersed in the negative. I never get immersed in the positive. <laughs> but, uh, but to me, crises exaggerate and exacerbate what already is there. It just highlights it. It makes it worse. And I, I've looked at the kind of prison conditions and jail conditions they have in Europe versus the kind they have in here. And the European philosophy is that the sentence to prison is the punishment. You don't have to degrade somebody. You don't have to go and you know treat them inhumanely. What you do is that, that the punishment is being isolated in prison. Okay, now that you're there, let's go and get you ready for return to society. Whereas here, it seems to just you know exacerbate the philosophy that somehow we have to grind the person into the ground. We have to dehumanize them. We have to degrade them. And that kind of uh, you know just hateful attitude, uh, I don't understand, but I think that the coronavirus unfortunately highlights it and puts a light onto it. Do, do you think that's connected to the connection between mass incarceration and systematic racism? Yes, I do. Yeah. I don't know if anybody here has seen the movie 13th. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody here has seen the Brian Stevenson movie, Just Mercy, or rather the movie based on Brian Stevenson, Just Mercy. But yes, I do think so. I think it's basically, uh, there is a connection uh, between mass incarceration and racism. I mean, if you look at the county jail, again, I can't speak to the prisons, I'm not an expert on that area, but in the county jail, approximately 76% of the county jail are black men. The population of Chicago and Cook County doesn't come anywhere close to being 76% black men, but that's the population of the county jail. If you look at the statistics of arrest by the Chicago Police Department, if you look at the statistics uh, for the people who were arrested during the, the protests, you know, this narrative was put out that everybody was arrested for looting, for example. 80% of the people who were arrested were arrested for disorderly conduct and released from the police station. And the vast, vast majority of the people who were arrested, again, were young black men. So do I think there's a connection? Absolutely. And, and, you know, just Hugh, br briefly, I mean, would you agree the same exists at the federal level? Yeah, I mean, uh, so we've talked a lot about how COVID has disproportionately affected um, non-incarcerated communities of, of color here in Chicago and elsewhere. But um, in, the, in the state prison um, example in Arkansas, I began with, so about 10%, 9, 10%, uh, of, of Arkansas residents are African American men, close to 50% uh, of the state prison population is African American men. And, and um, even though our federal numbers are coming down, that we still way outpace any other um, uh, uh, um, country in terms of the number of people we in, in incarcerate, are, the numbers are coming down by virtue of some sentencing reform, but still, as, as you um, well, no, it's it's a disproportionately African American male population, and so with COVID spreading through uh, prisons, it's 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 going to impact that population um, more 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 severely. So yeah, I, I, there, there's there's no there's no question about it, and um, 
again, I, despite Lester's lack of hopefulness, maybe I should take up for our hopefulness here. Um, some of the sentencing reform measures that we're seeing are oh, changing those figures modestly. Um, but again, uh, COVID, as Lester notes, has really highlighted um, not only the substandard medical care in, in prisons, but how it is disproportionately affecting African American men. My, I, I'll, I'll answer that by saying, if I have hopefulness, <laughs> if I do have hopefulness, it's that when you shine a light on something, you see it. Yeah. When it's hidden, it's under a rock. Before right. the Me Too movement, for example, you know, people thought sexual harassment might be cute. You know, uh, if you go if you go back far enough, and this is I I stole this concept by the way from Brian Stevenson, uh, about whom the movie Just Mercy was made. If he made a point that in the 60s, for example, in the early 70s, drunk driving was considered to be you know cute and harmless, and you would see it depicted in movies. But then the Mothers Against Drunk Drivers realized, no, we have to have a campaign. We have to change the culture of thought concerning this. Nobody sees drunk driving as cute anymore. So if you shine a light on something, if you show the, 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 the horrible results that come from it, then you can get people to change. And I see there was a question from uh, Jacqueline over here who talked about someone who died in the Cook County Jail because he didn't have enough money or, or rather, he had a ten thousand dollar I bond, but he didn't have any place uh, to go for housing. And so the question was, you know, how does the issue of incarcerating people because they're poor get addressed in bail reform? In my opinion, true bail reform is that money is removed from the equation. No cash bail, no monetary bail. You look at the individuals. The person of, uh, is a person of flight risk and is a person uh, a danger to the public if they're not. That's it, they, they get released. You don't go and say that someone should get locked up because uh, they don't have money. You don't say that someone is locked up because they don't have housing that you approve of. And by the way, I keep saying the two factors are public safety and failure to appear. By failure to appear, I don't mean that somebody forgot to come to court that day. That's not failure to appear. People sometimes do not come to court because they can't get the bus. I mean, consider for example, recently, uh, you know, I don't want to go and uh, be too, you know, critical, but uh, when we had the protest downtown, they wanted everybody out of downtown Chicago, and then they raised all the bridges so that nobody could get out of downtown Chicago, and they stopped both the L and the buses from running. Well, if you don't have the buses running, you can't come to court. If you don't have the L running, you can't come to court. You can't go and get to court. Now you have a warrant that's issued for your arrest, but that's not a failure to appear. In my mind, failure to appear is I fled for Key West. You know, I went to Mexico. I went to Canada. That's failure to appear. Not making it because of you know finances, circumstances. Uh, you know, I forgot. That's not failure to appear, and that shouldn't result in people getting locked up. And the question also raises this idea of not having housing at any given time. The jail, according to the list that the sheriff has, they have about 130 or 140 people who have no place to stay. And so they won't release them because they have no place to stay. Uh, they won't release them on electronic monitoring because they have uh, no place to stay. And you have people who are now caught between essentially a rock and a hard place. And they're there just because the housing situation isn't there. Well, you know what? If society is agreeing to prosecute someone, society should make sure that they have a place to stay. Yeah, it's yeah. Just intersection <laughs> issues. Um, right. It's it's hard to talk about this issue without talking about race. It's hard to talk about this issue without talking about poverty. It's hard to talk about this issue without talking about housing inequality. So many other social issues. Um, I wanted to to briefly bring up this point to both of you um, about how the current conditions in the court system is either helping or hurting advocacy for inmates. Um, a lot of courts have slowed down, have become virtual. Um, there's not a lot of in-person meetings with clients. Um, and so how has this shift to virtual courtrooms affected um, this conversation? 
uh, it's definitely creating it's definitely creating a backlog. It's slowing down the resolution of cases. Um, I was at a meeting yesterday uh, with the chief judge and several presiding judges, and I heard one presiding judge say, say that if we are back to our current caseload by December, I will be happy, is what he said. Uh, and uh, it has caused problem. You have everybody appearing by uh, Zoom. People who are out of custody are encouraged not to come to court. Uh, uh, for I, I don't think ID, uh, IDOC is the Illinois Department of Corrections. They had a prohibition for a while that even if we had, say, an agreement worked out for a client and the client wanted to plead guilty to uh, you know, get out of the jail and go to the prison, IDOC was not accepting any new intakes. Similarly, we had an issue with um, for clients who were found, uh, who, who we suspect, I won't say found, but who we suspect are not fit. So there's, you know, fitness for, uh, uh, fitness to go to trial and also not guilty by reason of insanity. Uh, forensic evaluations were not being done and the uh, Department of Mental Health, uh, D, uh, Department of Human Services, were not taking anybody in as intake. So everybody was just staying in their place. They wouldn't go. Uh, the opposite uh, situation was also true. We had some people who were at the Elgin Mental Health Center who have been restored to fitness, but they were not allowed to come back to the court system to go and be restored to fitness and then discharged because they didn't want anybody moving. They didn't want any kind of transfer from one place to another. Everybody was just essentially sheltering in place. So it has caused, uh, definitely caused headaches. Uh, when we go to the next phase at the current moment, based on the most recent information I have, uh, is the next phase will start on July 6th. And starting on July 6th, courts will reopen, but it's still going to be predominantly virtual, a case here and there where someone will physically be present, but predominantly virtual, and that is causing problems. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it in the, in the trial context, uh, I suppose, and, and um, as other speakers during um, these calls have said, this would be a, it, no pressure to turn on your, uh, your cameras, especially given bandwidth issues, but um, this would be an interesting time to see your sort of thoughts and reactions. Um, so there are areas where trials are happening, but what do those trials look like uh, for criminal defendants right now and what will they continue to, to look like? And I wanna just give you one example of a trial, uh, oh, three, four weeks ago in, in Memphis that went ahead as scheduled and the lawyers are required to select jurors from a from a pool uh the court attempts to socially distance the prospective jurors but says some of you might want to wear a mask others might not we don't have any formal requirements so do whatever you like uh and then 12 prospective jurors are put into the jury box uh, for um, questioning, and some have masks and some don't. So, do you like the prospective jurors who wear masks, or do you not? In a sort of constructive possession gun case, where the, of course the jury doesn't know, but the the, the defendant is looking at 15 years um, under the Armed Career, Career Criminal Act if he, he, if he's convicted. Um, what do you ask the jurors who aren't wearing masks? Uh, if a juror says he or she's not comfortable in the jury box with someone who's not wearing a mask, is that, a, is that good or is that bad? Um, not seeing the prospective jurors' facial expressions when you or the court asks questions, what does that do? Not having an opportunity to speak in whispers with your client about Perspective jurors, not to mention the ability to speak about witnesses when the when the trial starts. What does that do? And and the sense is that it makes everything much more difficult for uh, for criminal defendants. And and if you've um, uh, been a student in class in in trial advocacy, you know that I think that jury selection is far more important than oh, I don't know, virtually any other aspect of the trial. So 
Um, even cases that are going to trial, and maybe that's a long-winded way of, of, of saying, uh, especially for uh, new public defenders and, and, and interns who are working with criminal defense lawyers, or even if you're at the state's attorney or the um, U.S. attorney's office as an intern, we've got to think critically about how this pandemic is going to affect cases that manage to go to trial and what that's going to look like for whatever our notion of, of, of justice is um, when you're dealing with really difficult uh, difficult cases, especially from the, from, from the defense side. So I might throw that out for all of you to, 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 to consider. We have another question in the chat. Uh, it says, speaking of juries, are we concerned for the future when jury trials are back and what the jury selection will look like concerning the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on the black community? I, I am concerned about, first off, I don't even know when they're going to have jury trials coming back. I've heard a number of people express concern that a lot of people will possibly ignore their jury summonses out of fear until there's a until either COVID is cured or there's a vaccine you know one or the other um the uh jury summonses that go out um uh i've actually checked at least locally uh i uh, had an issue once where i was challenging uh, most of my career has been doing appeals by the way so i had an issue once where i was challenging the composition of the veneer for a jury and I actually went and talked to the jury commissioner of Cook County, and I learned that uh, for Cook County, when the jury summonses go out, they have a line of demarcation, and that line is Roosevelt Road. I assume everybody here is local, so they all know where Roosevelt Road is. So anything, if you live north of Roosevelt Road- That's basically- be, Yeah, well, if you live north of Roosevelt Road, you can be called for jury service to either Skokie or Rolling Meadow Courthouse, uh, or 26th Street. If you live south of Roosevelt Road, you can, you can, you're eligible to be called for jury duty to the Markham Courthouse, the British View Courthouse, or 26th Street. 26th Street draws from the entire population. But uh, there is going to be concern about uh, the fear. There's going to be concern about interaction. There's going to be concern about spacing. And even when there is spacing, you can space people in a courtroom. How are you going to space people when they deliberate in those jury rooms? I don't know how many people on the call have ever seen the jury rooms behind the courtrooms in the suburbs or 26th Street, but there's no room there to socially distance. So yes, there, uh, there, there is concern about the willingness of people to serve on the jury. And also the, you know, the, as you said, it's impossible to go and separate uh, the pandemic from mass incarceration from racism and how are people going to be looking at their fellow jurors and are they going to be willing to deliberate and cooperate? Yes, that is of concern. Hugh, I saw you shaking your head. Or oh, yeah, I, I agree added. and, and um, may, may have um, uh, uh, in my last uh, comment, um, answered some of the, some of those, um, you know, some similar points. But um, look, like so. I again, I am um, seeing so many students' uh, names on this call, and um, there are these are going to be. It's going to be a difficult year. It may be the, a difficult next five years. Uh, but um, I do think that we we are sort of trying to, to trend in the right uh, direction in terms of sentencing reform. We're seeing slightly more cases on the federal level go to trial because of the lack of mandatory, or the, the, not so much the lack, but, but um, mandatory minimums being um, utilized less often by way of filing information. Um, but I do think that for those reasons, the I, I'm not saying, Look, I, I consider myself a, a, you know, when people say you're a former trial lawyer, it's, well, I'm a former guilty plea lawyer because 90% of cases at the federal level uh, plead out. And, and I think that that's changing a little bit, which gives me lots of optimism for our students and, and graduates who might actually get to try cases. 
um, unlike unlike the the majority of, of my practice. But um, with that is going to present some challenges that that Lester identifies and and uh, and that I spoke about earlier. But on balance, um, the opportunity to try cases is a good thing, and um, I would. Look, I mean, if, if I was out from under a mandatory minimum, I would welcome the opportunity to figure out how to social distance jurors deliberation room because um, unfortunately that never, um, you know, that I had very few juries deliberating because of the, you know, the incentives to, to plead guilty and get some sort of modest sentencing benefit. So there are gonna be challenges with, with juries and those challenges may persist over the next few years. Um, but I'm really excited about some of the even modest um, sentencing reform legislation that might enable our, uh, our, our graduates to, to try a case or two. In, a, in our last uh, remaining minutes, I wanted to ask about kind of next steps and where advocacy goes now. Um, so starting with Cook County Jail, um, what are some of the things that the public defender's office is looking to do or continue to do um, in conjunction with some of the Cook County offices? Well, for one thing, we wanna go and keep the jail population down. We don't wanna to return to 5,700. We never thought there was a reason to go and have that there. Uh, we wanna be, uh, and uh, if I could just make a comment on that, I don't know if people have seen the news, but uh, uh, the, late, the newest superintendent uh, uh, of police, uh, Superintendent Brown, he has said that, uh, oh, you know, you need to keep more people in jail. You need to keep more of them locked up. And uh, Sheriff Dart has also said that he thinks electronic monitoring is given out way too much uh, and that more people, uh, you know, should remain uh, basically in jail. Um, I disagree with that. So one of the, to, to me, the main next step is to change the way people think, start to recognize that individuals who are charged with whatever they're charged with have basic rights of dignity, basic rights of respect. Don't treat them as, you know, others, you know, I, I hate this philosophy of, you know, uh, you know, there's people within the court system and people outside of the court system and somehow, uh, you know, there's like, uh, you know, people who are insiders and outsiders and that's just, it's anathema to me to change their philosophy, to change the narrative, to change the culture of thought. And for this to be used as a springboard to go and say, we have too many people locked up anyways. We have too many people who are in jail. We have too many people in prison. Don't you recognize this? I mean, the extreme example was I saw somebody who couldn't get out on electronic, uh, electronic monitoring because he was homeless. Why was he arrested? For bicycling on the sidewalk. Because Chicago has a stupid ordinance that if you're over 12 years old, you can't bicycle on the sidewalk and somebody arrested him. Are they crazy? You know, that kind of philosophy that, oh, somehow somebody deserves to be locked up for that. No, and to me, the next step is start thinking intelligently use your brain you have it use it do you for the agreements for release do you think that there will be more consensus around people that don't need to be in jail period i'm hopeful i'm hopeful i have seen the state go and agree to uh you know move things i have to compliment uh you know kim fox she uh on her own unilaterally uh before marijuana was you know, decriminalized in Illinois, she basically decriminalized the prosecution of it. And on her own, she's not prosecuting people for certain retail theft offenses uh, if it's under a certain you know, dollar amount. So I think there is room for agreement, but, uh, but, but basic human respect, if you respect yes. the person who's next to you as, 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 as yourself, uh, then everything flows from that. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mundy, same for you. Um, so I don't know if uh, if any of you are subscribers to Disney Plus, uh, but 
Hamilton uh, is dropping oh, sometime in the next few weeks. And um, there has been oh, some uh, writing about whether Hamilton is going to land as it did in 2015 with, with um, uh, the viewing public. And, and one line out of one song, it's a great time to be alive. I'm kind of paraphrasing, but I think that's basically it. And the, the anticipated reaction is, really? It is. I, I'm not sure it feels like that right now. Um, so, I, but I want to leave you with a note of positivity. Um, number one, the American Law Institute, uh, the, the 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 folks who bring you the model penal code for all of you criminal law fans, uh, has recently, within the last year, uh, published um, uh, uh, new guidelines on sentencing reform that all bend against mass incarceration. So we are finally after, oh, what, the late 70s maybe, seeing a movement against mass incarceration that you as criminal defense attorneys and conscientious prosecutors uh, can be part of. And that's a really exciting thing. And it is great to be alive for you all as aspiring practitioners to be part of that movement after so many decades of being um, uh, under this, this incredibly unsuccessful um, movement uh, of mass incarceration. So that's that's the first thing. The, the second thing is, as new lawyers or aspiring lawyers, don't forget the, that, that probation and other forms of supervision that do not involve incarceration can be equally as oppressive on your clients. And as we move away from mass incarceration, do not capitulate to conditions that are um, that are impossible for your clients to, or anyone for that matter, to conform to. So, um, even though we're moving away from mass incarceration, as, and as new lawyers, you might see many misdemeanors that result in sentences of probation or other uh, uh, forms of um, uh, supervision. Those are incredibly important moments for your clients, and um, you should fight against any kind of um, oh, uh, 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 forms of supervision that are just untenable, just as you would against a jail or prison sentence. So don't get comfortable either. Right. And if I could just piggyback off of that, we have seen time and again where what we thought, where what the attorney thought was a small conviction, wound up with deportation. You know, because there are immigration consequences to it. And we've had clients who literally were taken into custody by Immigration Customs Enforcement as they walked out of the courthouse. Yeah. So, uh, yes, there are consequences there, even for supervision and probation, as you say. Thanks, everyone. Well, <laughs> our time is coming to an end. Thank you both for joining us today and having this discussion. Uh, we look forward to how we can engage um, around how um, social justice issues are affecting uh, so many of our populations during this pandemic. And can I do a quick CSO career services plug? If any of our students are interested in externships with the public defender's office, what's the best route to take? Look, check the public defender's website. Well, not well, check the public defender's website, uh, but also we are required. We're under our own federal consent decree as part of the county. The county has a federal consent decree called the Shackman Consent Decree. Uh, because if you go back to many, many years, uh, the city and the county were accused of engaged in patronage hiring. I can't believe that, but the city and the county were accused of that. So there is a consent decree. So there is a, uh, a website that even applies to externs and interns through the uh, uh, Cook County portal uh, for internship opportunities. Uh, if you want, I can send it to you uh, later, but it only, it'll only it come up like three or four times a year, and then you apply through that portal. Okay, so the Cook County portal will yeah. then send them to the Cook County Defender's Office. Uh, we'll uh, send them to, right, right, for the application okay. process, and you upload all your material. Yes. Awesome, awesome. Just wanted to make sure our students knew that. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to end the meeting. This recording will be available um, on our on the law school's uh, YouTube site. Um, and thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dean. All right, bye-bye. Thank you.